Hello, church family. It's Pastor Neil here, and welcome to this week's online message. What we're going to do today is we're going to wrap up our SOS sermon series. But before we do that, I think we need to spend a little bit of time talking about this whole online church thing. This is new. It's new for all of us. It's certainly new for you sitting at home on your couch probably right now, maybe at your dining room table. It's definitely new for, for me and your other pastors just trying to think about how we can connect to you even though we're, we're apart. And so I've been thinking about this quite a bit uh, lately for lots of reasons. Uh, certainly it's the majority of what it is that I'm doing right now that all of your pastors are doing right now trying to figure out this whole online church thing. But I've been thinking about it as well because it's just, it's a little strange. From, from the inception of the church, the church has always really taught that we need to be gathering together, like physically gathering together. The writer of Hebrews says, let's not get out of the habit of gathering together, as some of you have done. And so for us not to be able to do that right now, for it to be discouraged, for it to be potentially dangerous, it's really, it's kind of a, a strange thing. And so I've been thinking about this quite a bit. I've been praying about this quite a bit. How can we still fulfill the vision and mission that God uh, has given us of connecting people to Jesus, of staying connected to Jesus, of worshiping, growing, serving, and telling. How can we, how can we do that when we can't get together, when we can't be in, I guess, normal community with one another? So I've been praying about this quite a bit. I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and I've been kind of digging through God's word. And as God has always done, he, he, he led me to really start to examine the, the life of, of Paul, the Apostle Paul. And God's so good at always directing me in, in his word. And there, obviously, Paul lived a lot of life. There's a lot of things that, uh, you know, Paul did in his life. But specifically, he led me to Paul's imprisonment. You see, Paul spent quite a bit of time in, in jail. He spent time quarantined, if you will. He was isolated. He was set apart. He, he wasn't allowed to have contact with the church body. And as I was reading that, as I was thinking about that, I thought that's, that's kind of how the majority of us feel right now, probably. Some of us are, are actually quarantined. We're, maybe we are sick and, and we're not leaving our house. Maybe some of us are kind of self-quarantined uh, where, you know, we're just we're trying to be really cautious and consider our family but consider others as well. And all of that can lead to this feeling of imprisonment, if you will. And Ohio is is tough enough like we're just coming out of the winter season and because it's cold because it's been snowy and we've had a good winter don't send me emails like it's been a great winter I, we have had a good winter but it's still winter it's still cold outside and so I've noticed it a lot since I've had a little one who just stares out the window like longing and wishing to be outside and then when we drive by the park he's yelling park park and we're like no no like it's disgusting outside so we've already kind of feel like we've been in prison for several months because of the weather and now all of a sudden, we, we're not supposed to be around one another to help stop the spread of this corona, coronavirus. So what are we supposed to do? How can we fulfill this vision and mission? Well, I want us to go to Acts chapter 16. There's this uh, section of scripture in the book of Acts, um, and it's just a, it's a crazy, it is a crazy story about the Apostle Paul and Silas. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Acts chapter 16. You can read along with me here. And I'm, I'm using the uh, New Living Translation. It's the NLT version. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon, clamped their feet in the stocks. And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and he assumed the prisoners had escaped so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in the household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and he washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. 
He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. I want to point out several things here. Um, because this, this is just absolutely packed full of just, I think, very relevant uh, content for us. First thing I want to point out is this. Paul was not only imprisoned, he was beaten. And he wasn't just beaten. The NLT makes a point to, to highlight the fact that he was severely beaten. And what is the first thing that Paul does? After he's beaten severely and thrown in prison, the inner dungeon, stocks and chains, what does he do? Verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Paul had just been beaten. He's probably still, well, we know he's still bloody. His wounds haven't been dressed because the jailer dresses his wounds later on in the text. He's probably swollen, still bleeding, in stocks, in chains, and the first thing he does is worship. He begins to pray. He begins worshiping through prayer, worshiping through song, singing hymns to God. Brothers and sisters, even though we might feel isolated, even though we aren't in contact with one another, we still should be worshiping our God. We should still be praying fervently, perhaps now more than ever, praying fervently we should be worshiping, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to our Lord and Savior. Even though we're in isolation, even though we feel in prison, we need to worship. What else does Paul do? The very next verse, verse 26. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. So Paul's in chains. He's got stocks around his feet. He's in the inner dungeon. He's been beaten, he's swollen, he's bloody. He starts worshiping God, and then God does a miracle. God does a miracle. He causes an earthquake to, to, to happen, and all of a sudden, chains are falling off, prison doors are opening up. You, you want to talk about grow. Can you imagine, can you imagine how much Paul's faith grew in that moment? He's witnessing a miracle. And brothers and sisters, even though we may feel imprisoned right now, even though we may be quarantined or feel quarantined, even though we're feeling the sense of isolation, God can still grow us. He can grow our faith just like he grew Paul's faith. That's a miracle. When God grows our faith, that is a miracle. So Paul worshiped. Paul grew. What else did Paul do? Look at the next couple of verses. Verse 27, the jailer woke up to see the prison doors were wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted at him, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. So this jailer knows that if all of these prisoners are escaped, he's as good as dead anyway. So he decides to take matters into his own hand. He draws his sword and he's like, I'm just going to end my own life. But Paul stops him. He shouts. He's like, stop, don't do it. We're all still here. Do you see what Paul is doing here? Paul is serving this jailer by doing the selfless thing and staying in his cell. Even though the doors are open, even though the chains are gone, even though Paul could have walked right out those doors, Paul served the jailer by doing the selfless thing of staying in his cell. And this has so many implications for us today. And I don't want to get too heavy into this, uh, but I want to make sure that I say this. Right now, every single one of us has the opportunity to serve other people by staying in our cell. Our government has recommended uh, certain things in relationship to social distancing and brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans that we need to adhere to these authorities. We need to adhere to these guidelines. And so I want to encourage you as a means to serve others if you need to. Stay in your cell. But while you're in your cell, look at your cellmates. Look at your husband. Look at your wife. Look at your kids. Look at your parents. Maybe look at your, your grandparents, whoever is living in your home, and take this as an opportunity to serve those in your cell. Husbands, serve your wives. Wives, serve your husbands. Parents, serve your kids. Kids, serve your parents. And if you're at home all alone and you've got nobody in your house that you have physical contact with, then serve people you have contact with outside of physical contact. We've all got virtual contact with sometimes hundreds of people. Use your Facebook to serve people, to encourage 
people. Use your Instagram, your Twitter, whatever it is. Serve those you have contact with. And finally, what did Paul do? Let's keep reading. Verse 29, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Through this imprisonment, Paul took the opportunity to tell. He took the opportunity to connect not only this jailer, but every person in this jailer's house to Jesus. And brothers and sisters, even though we may feel isolated, even though we are isolated, even though we are quarantined, even though we won't have contact perhaps with the outside world, even though we won't have contact with as many people as normal, we still need to be looking for and taking opportunities to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ with people. Once again, the people in your home, some of us live in homes with people that don't believe in Jesus Christ, don't have a relationship with him. Use this as an opportunity to tell. You're gonna be spending more time with them than perhaps you normally do. Make sure your conversations are centered on Christ, rooted in the truth of God's word. Use your social media, use your Facebook, use all of these platforms to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ to encourage one another. Church, God's sovereignty, it hasn't changed because of the coronavirus. God is still in charge. God is still overall and God is still through all. And our call to connect people to Jesus, to stay connected to Jesus, to worship, to grow, to serve, and to tell hasn't changed because of the coronavirus. What we do hasn't changed. How we do it has changed. And whether we are healthy, whether we're sick, whether we are in community, or whether or not we are isolated, we still have a call to connect people to Jesus, to stay connected to Jesus, to worship, to grow, to serve, and to tell. And now perhaps, maybe more than ever in the history of the majority of our lives, people need hope. And as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, We know, we know the only place to find that hope is in Jesus. Jesus is the only place we can find that hope. And whether you are Christian or not, I think many of us are experiencing a sense of hopelessness right now. We're experiencing anxiety and stress and fear. But don't forget Don't forget Psalm 46. Listen to this. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. You see, a river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms are crumbling and God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow, he snaps the spear, and he burns the shields with fire. But be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Church, God is our refuge. God is our strength. So we will not fear. We will not fear the economy. We will not fear the loss of a job. We will not fear the loss of our finances. We will not fear the loss of health. We will not fear 
the coronavirus because God is still in charge. He is sovereign. So as the writer of Isaiah would say, so take a new grip with your tired hands. Strengthen your weak knees and put your hope in Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of all things, the God almighty, the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. Amen. Hello, friends. I'm Pastor David, and I wanted to thank you so much for joining us online today. As we continue to navigate what it's like to have church from home, I kept going back to our mission and vision here at Hope of connecting people to Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is by worshiping. When we worship, it's so much more than just singing. We are sitting before the Lord with a posture of surrender. There is a peace that overcomes us when we spend time in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I know that peace is exactly what we need right now. So this week, we wanted to lead you and your families in worship because God is good, God is worthy, and there is comfort in our praise. The words in these songs are a battle cry in such a time of distress. Psalm 59, 16 says, As for me, I will sing of your power. Each morning I will, will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I'm in distress. So as we sing today, I encourage you to worship in your homes, however that may look. And let us find comfort in our praise as we worship our Lord who is faithful. Surrounding me, let it pray at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every way at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, I call these bones to breathe, I call these lungs to sing once again, and I will praise, oh. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus.
that the shadows can't deny your neck cannot be overcome and your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny
we thank you that we can run to you in times of hurt, in times of the unknown, in times of stress. God, when we are trembling, God, we run to you, our fortress, our refuge, where we find our strength, where we find hope. God, you came to this earth to give us hope of eternal life. Would you help us to keep our eyes focused on you? focused on your faithfulness. God, may we see the faithfulness in these times. God, we thank you for opportunities like this where we can gather together in our homes and worship you, God. May you hear these songs and this worship as a sweet, sweet sound to your ear. We praise you, almighty God. For it's your one and only name mighty name of Jesus. We all say together, amen, amen. So today we're going to be wrapping up our SOS sermon series. And what we've been doing in this series is we've been talking about how we can and should be choosing our Savior over our sin. And seven weeks ago, when we were all still friends and hanging out, uh, we handed out some of these SOS bracelets. And they say Savior over sin on them. And I know it's been several weeks since we've done a bracelet check. And you might be thinking, well, it's a little silly to do a bracelet check now because we're all at home in our pajamas and we don't have our bracelets on. It doesn't matter. We're still going to do a bracelet check, and the reason we're going to do this is because we put cameras in all your houses. We had no, that's not true. Uh, although we do have your addresses. Um, let me. T- this is strange uh, because no one laughs. No one's laughing uh, right now. And when you make jokes on a Sunday morning, uh, people laugh. And, and some of you are thinking we wouldn't have laughed at that anyways because it's just not funny. Uh, but it's a little strange, so we might insert some laugh tracks. But it doesn't matter. It's fine. We're all good. I'll make David laugh really loud. David's here. David, yell hello. Hello. (laughs) That is David. Uh, Send David and our worship team, which is Bob, an email and just uh, show your appreciation for them. We're so thankful um, to have this means of communication where we can still lead uh, you in worship during this, this time. But let's go ahead. Let's do our bracelet check. Just show your TV the bracelet. Good enough. Uh, Here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you to keep wearing these. The encouragement was to wear it throughout the entirety of the series all the time. Some of you did that. Some of you didn't. I did that. I know the majority of our pastors did that as well. I encourage you to at least be wearing it on Sunday morning. I know some of us did that. But I think right now is a really good time to remind ourselves that we have a choice every single day to make. With all that's happening in our world, it is so easy to slip into sin, to slip into worry, to slip into panic, to slip into judgment, to slip into to, the list of sins is endless. And so we have a choice to make. I mean, talk about an SOS. We are experiencing an SOS in our world that hasn't been seen in, in 
decades and decades. And so right now we've got an opportunity to, to make the choice every single day to choose our Savior over our sins. So I'm going to keep wearing these as you see, the, wearing this I should say, as you see these videos, I'll still have this on and I want to encourage you to do the same. But let's go ahead and, and dig into uh, the final installment, if you will, of this particular sermon series. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Proverbs chapter 6. This has been our key section of scripture for this, and let's read together. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, in a person who sows discord in a family. So, so far we've covered the sins of a haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent. We've got hearts that plot evil. We've got feet that race to do wrong. And then last week we talked about a false witness who pours out lies. So today we're going to cover a person who sows discord in a family. There's six things the Lord hates. There are seven things he detests. A person who sows discord in a family. Now, in order to really understand what Solomon is talking about here, we, we need to take a closer look at two words in this verse, two words in verse 19. We need to examine the word discord and the word family. The other words in the verse I think we've got a pretty good understanding of, like we know what a person is and we know what so means, even though the majority of us aren't farmers. Maybe some of you have planted a garden at some point in your life, but even if you haven't, you still know what the word so means. It, it means to, to plant, to spread, to scatter, and this idea of seed. So we need to talk about these two words, discord and this word family. So let's start with the word discord. What does discord mean? Well, just like we talked about at the beginning of the series when we talked about haughty eyes and how the word haughty isn't a word that we often use in our world and our normal conversations, it's the same with this word discord. I've, in fact, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody use the word discord in, in just a normal conversation. Like nobody is like, my goodness, that person's sowing quite a bit of discord. Huh? Like that just doesn't, that doesn't happen in the circles that I, I run in. So what does this word discord mean? Well, discord can mean a lot of different things. It can mean conflict. It can mean strife. It can mean trouble. It can mean tension. But I think my favorite definition of the word discord, and one that I think maybe fits best with what Solomon is trying to communicate here, is this. Discord. What is it? Discord is a lack of harmony. Discord is a lack of of harmony. And for those of you that are musicians or those of you that are fans of music, you you understand what harmony is more than likely. But but if you don't know what harmony is, here's what harmony is. Harmony is a combination of musical notes that are played at the same time that create a pleasant sound. Harmony is a combination of musical notes that are played at the same time that create a pleasant sound. I wish I had a, a way to, I guess, show you how to, what that is. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Excuse me. <laughs> you guys thought, you thought it was bad on Sunday mornings. Well, guess what? Now I have access to special effects. So there you go. So let's talk about let's talk about harmony. I've got I've got the old trusty guitar. You know what? Let's not talk about harmony. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna play a, I'm just gonna play some original music for you right now. Yeah. It's a song off my latest record called Songs of Food. This is a song I wrote called Pizza. Ooh, I love pizza. Ooh, I wanna eat you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's just so stupid. All right, let's give you. A, I'm gonna give you a quick and basic theory lesson. This is a G chord. A chord is made up of a series of notes, a combination of notes. This is a G major. A G major consists of speaking intervallically. You've got a root note, a G. You've got a major third. That's a B, and then you've got a fifth. That's a D. If I want to make it a minor, I flat the third. And that's what you have. So within the major scale, I can play any of those notes within the major scale and add them to this chord. And it's still going to be a pleasant sound. 
And that sounds pleasing to us. Even if you're not necessarily a musician, you kind of understand that this sounds pleasing, right? But if I, if I change it, if I add a note in this outside of that major scale, for example, if I take the G and I sharp it, I move it a semitone up, all of a sudden, that harmony changes. Here's what it sounds like, ready? Here's the G major, and then here is the lack of harmony. Ooh, I love pizza, ooh, I want it. It sounds terrible, even if you're not a musician, you know that sounds terrible. So, a lack of harmony is adding or playing the wrong notes within the chord along with the other notes being played. And so, you know what? I should probably get rid of this. <laughs> Magic. And here we go. I'm going to use my... Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. If you guys are still watching, thanks for hanging in for, there for all that nonsense. So here's the thing, even if you're a musician or not, you know what sounded good. As I was playing that G chord, you could, could tell like, hey, all of these notes are, are harmonious. They sound good together. And then when I sharped that G, there was a note outside of the scale and it sounded terrible. And so when Solomon says that God hates, God detests a person who sows discord in a family, what he's saying is, he hates, he detests a person that's playing the wrong notes. A person that is intentionally or maybe even unintentionally playing the wrong notes. And where are they playing the wrong notes? Well, they're playing them in this family. So let's talk about the word family. Right? Proverbs six nineteen. A person who sows discord in a family. What does Solomon mean by this word family? Is Solomon talking about our immediate family? Is he talking about our extended family, our church family, our work family? Well, the answer is, is yes. He's, he's talking about really everybody in your life. You see, the better translation for the word family that's used there is community. In fact, some translations actually use the word community. And what is a community? Well, a very simple definition of a community is this. Anywhere you have fellowship with others. Your community is anywhere you have fellowship with others. In other words, it's anywhere and everywhere that you are. It's at your home. It's at your work. It's at the gym. It's at the grocery store. It's at, maybe you do yoga. It's at the yoga studio. Wherever it is, it's where you get your hair cut. It's anywhere and everywhere you are. And so when Solomon says that God hates, God detests a person who sows discord in a family, He's saying that God hates when people go around and play the wrong notes, cause a lack of harmony, conflict, tension, dissension, trouble within their community, within the circles of people that they exist. God doesn't like the way that sounds. It's unpleasant to him. And you see, there's lots of ways that you can hit bad notes. There's lots of bad notes that you can hit, but I want to hone in for the rest of our time today. I want to hone in. I want to focus in on one way that we sow discord, one way that we can cause a lack of harmony in our community, that we can cause a lack of harmony anywhere and everywhere we are with people. And the one I want to talk about today is this, gossip. I want to talk about gossip. And what is gossip? Well, gossip is actually a little more difficult to define than you might think, but I think this is a good working definition of gossip. What's gossip? It is a casual or unconstrained conversation about other people's personal business. A casual or unconstrained conversation about other people's personal business. In other words, maybe you're just casually bringing up the topic. Maybe you're talking to a friend and you're like, oh yeah, I was at the mall today and oh yeah, I saw Stacy. Ah, she's not really doing that well. I guess her and her husband are having some, some trouble. And, and so you're, it's not that you're intentionally, although you should be aware of what you're saying, it's not that you're intentionally trying to gossip. It just kind of casually comes up. But again, that's still gossip or it's unconstrained. In other words, there's no restriction. You're just like, you've got this information and you just, you can't wait to tell, you're just like, you hear about Stacy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Her and the old man are having a little problem. Ooh, we got some good juice, right? And so you're, you're unrestricted. You're intentionally trying to do this. And here's the thing about gossip. The majority of people don't gossip to 
encourage the people they're speaking to or speak positively about the person they're speaking about. Most of the time, gossip has this negative connotation. We want to share this information because we're we're trying to have people form an opinion of another person or maybe we're sharing this information because we just we we got to get in the middle of the drama right we just we've got it and it's just it, it it's hot and i think this sin of gossip is one of those sins in our life that as christians as faithful followers of jesus like we know we know the sin of gossip is is wrong we know we shouldn't do it we know the bible says don't gossip but it's one of those sins where we're like, yeah, I mean, is it really that? Is it really that bad? I mean, <laughs> it's not like I'm murdering somebody, right? I'm not killing anybody over here. I'm just doing a little bit of gossip, right? Uh, but here's the thing. Listen to Romans 1, starting in, in verse 28. He says, since they thought it foolish, and there's a lot before that. You may want to read, give it a little bit of context. I'm not going to do that today, but it still applies. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. And let them do things that should never be done. And then pay attention to this. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Sin. Greed. Hate. Envy. Murder. Quarreling. Deception. Malicious behavior. And gossip. Did you catch that? Gossip is in the same list as murder. Yet... The majority of us, I would say, probably not too many of us, I would say, when we start a conversation, do we take a step back and think, huh, is this gossip? Am I about to share something about somebody else? It's got nothing to do with me. Maybe it even does have something to do with me. It's their personal business. Am I about to engage in gossip or... Am I about to listen to gossip? Because you see, listening to gossip is just as bad as being the gossiper itself. Listening to gossip is still participating in gossip. But it's really tough, isn't it? It is. It is really tough to stop somebody if they're about to gossip and you're about to listen. Why? Because it's so good. Oh, oh, oh man. Right? Gossip is just so, it's so juicy. It's just, oh, 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 I've been dying to know about Stacy. <laughs> I know. I know you know something about Stacy. And so sometimes we'll even, we'll even set the ball, so to speak. And somebody comes down and just spikes it for us. And we're like, ah, so, um, how's Stacy doing? Have you heard anything about Stacy? And then you're just like, come on, give it to me. Right? And then the person's like, oh, yeah, man, you hear about Stacy? Ooh, I got some juice for you. And it's, it is, it's like a drug for some of us. We just have to have it. And see, the Bible knows how good gossip is. Listen to Proverbs chapter 18. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. And when I think of choice morsels, I think of Nestle morsels, which, my friends, are very choice. And right now, there's somebody sitting on the couch going, I don't really like chocolate. And you know what? Stop watching. No, kidding. Please keep watching. Listen, Proverbs 18, the words of a gospel are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. Proverbs 26, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. Did you catch that? This is a rare occurrence in God's word where the exact same words are in the exact same order, in the exact same book, but in different chapters. And what does it say? What does it say? There's it says that the words of gossip, gossip is like a choice morsel. It just, it's, we crave it, we desire it, and man, does it go down smooth. But the Bible speaks directly against gossip, not just being the gossiper, but listening to gossip. Listen to this, Proverbs 20. A gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang around with chatterers. A gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang around with chatterers. The Bible says if there is a person in your life, if there is a person in your life that is a gossiper, every time you hang out with them, it just seems like they start to gossip. And, and maybe, again, you're not the one gossiping, but you're listening. If there is a person in your life that does that, don't hang out with them. Stay away from them. That's what it says. Don't hang around with chatterers. 
We need to be avoiding gossip. We need to be avoiding listening to gossip. But what if we are the gossiper? What if we are the person that just goes around telling everybody's business to everybody else? Well, here's the thing. God hates that. God detests that as well. It's unpleasant to him. And it's unpleasant to him because you are going around sowing discord, causing a lack of harmony, playing the wrong notes in the community that God has placed you, in the family that God has placed you, in the home that God has placed you, in the place of business that God has placed you, at the gym God has placed you, at the grocery store, you are causing a lack of harmony. And I'm gonna take it one step further because the Bible takes it one step further. If gossip is a pattern of sin in your life, that is an indication, and this is a strong statement, that is an indication that the Holy Spirit of God may not be in you. And I know that's bold, but listen to what James says. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Listen to this. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Church, you can't control your tongue and gossip at the same time. It's impossible. You can't do both. And what does James say? James says, the Bible says, God says, if you can't control your tongue and gossip is not controlling your tongue, then you're fooling yourself. You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself about what? You're kidding yourself about being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. If this is a pattern of sin, I'm not talking about the incidental moments where you gossip, we all make mistakes, we all have that sin nature, we don't want to be dominated by that sin nature. Paul tells us this in Romans 7 and 8, right? But if this is a pattern, if you find yourself constantly gossiping, if you find yourself constantly listening to gossip, if you find yourself constantly seeking gossip out, you might be fooling yourself. You might be kidding yourselves because the bible tells us that gossip sows discord causes conflict tension trouble it's the wrong notes and the bible tells us instead of doing that we should be living in harmony romans chapter 12 paul says live in harmony with each other church Every single day, every single day, we have this SOS. We have this choice where we can choose the sin of gossip or we can choose the Savior. We can choose harmony. And God hates, God detests gossip. It is unpleasant to him. He doesn't want to hear it. So the question I have for you today is this. Do you participate in gossip? Do you participate in gossip? Maybe you're not the gossiper. Maybe you're not the person that goes around and, and just seems to share all the information about other people that you've stored up, that you've gathered. But maybe you're the listener. Maybe you don't walk away when you hear the gossip. Maybe you don't. Maybe. Maybe you've become so desensitized you can't even recognize it as gossip. But God hates that. God detests that. Or maybe you're the gossiper. Maybe you are the one that just for some reason always seems to stick your nose in other people's business and share other people's business and you just can't seem to use discernment. You always choose that sin. Well, God hates that too. God detests that. It's unpleasant to him. 
So here's the challenge for all of us this week. Whether you are a gossiper, whether you are the person that listens to gossip, or whether you're neither, the call for us is the same. Choose harmony. Choose harmony. I think with what's happening in our world today, I mean, gossip is like at an all-time high. We're telling other people's business. Rumors might be a part of that. Lots of rumors going around. We have a choice every single day to choose the Savior, to choose harmony, or to choose the sin, to choose gossip. So brothers and sisters, may we take this SOS seriously. May we choose our Savior over sin. May we choose harmony over gossip. Amen? You can shout amen at home. Amen? Amen. Oh, look at David. He's participating. (laughs) All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for this series. God, I think this is a really timely series for us as we are experiencing a massive SOS in our world today. We're going to have a choice every single day to, to choose haughty eyes, to choose a lying tongue, to choose hands that kill the innocent, to choose a heart that plots evil, to choose feet that race to do wrong, to choose a false witness, or to choose to be a person that gossips, that sows discord. Father, may we choose our Savior. May we always choose you. You are always the best choice. So Holy Spirit, would you convict us uh, this week? Would you convict us in perpetuity that we would choose our Savior over sin? And Lord, specifically this week, may we choose harmony. May we look at ways that we can be unified as a body, that we can be unified as a world. Lord, do this through the power of your Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, church family, I love you all. I miss you all like crazy. We are so looking forward to being together with you. Hopefully soon, uh, we, are, we are desiring that. We do have some amazing and some really exciting things coming your way. I'll give you just a little sneak peek. We've got a new website design that's coming. It's called Hope Online. We're going to have all kinds of resources, all kinds of content for you. Uh, we're going to be giving content to you every single day. I don't want to say too much, but we are working tirelessly to make sure that we are staying connected to you so that we can help connect you to Jesus Christ. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and then go to the church website and look for updates. We will hopefully see you soon and have a great week.